Good. So at this point, I need you to make sure that at the top of your page, you only see the title meiosis. If you have another page in your note packet for some crazy reason, please cross it off, especially if it says overview of meiosis. Okay? So here's what I want you to look at. I want you to look at the definition of meiosis, and there's not really a spot for you to write it in, but you could just jot down um, just, just one thing. Don't write down this entire definition. Meiosis is cell division in which the chromosome number is cut in half. Okay, That is going to take us from the diploid number, 46 chromosomes in a normal body cell, to haploid, to 23. Now, this process involves two nuclear divisions, meaning the nucleus is going to divide twice. The cell is going to divide twice. Okay. So this is to produce the gametes, and these are the haploid sex cells. So at the top of your page, if you're going to write anything for meiosis, write down number is cut in half equals haploid. Okay, Gametes are the haploid sex cells. Those are in male sperm and in female egg. Okay, So exactly what does that mean? Okay, so the cells are going to prepare to undergo meiosis right at the end of interphase they go through G1 growth S or the synthesis replicating the DNA and then G2 preparing to divide and they divide but then they divide again without going through interphase, interphase. so exactly what does that mean okay there isn't a spot for you to write this down but I want you to pay attention right now Here's the thing, okay? So when the DNA gets copied, the original cell has 46 chromosomes. Right before it's copied, okay, it doubles. It's got 92 involved, okay? That's a lot of chromosomes. So when it splits and it goes undergoes normal cell division, each new body cell ends up with 46 chromosomes. Okay? So now, because meiosis is two divisions back to back, the cell doesn't have time to create another copy of the DNA. So we're starting with those 46 chromosomes. Okay? The DNA actually does not get copied. So I've only got 46. And then when it splits, oh, here, now Mrs. Learned messed it up. Let's, let's erase that, okay? Let's erase that. Let's look at this. I apologize. So normally in meiosis, a cell has 46 chromosomes. It goes through its normal first division, just like I previously showed you with mitosis. It creates 92 chromosomes because it doubles. In the first division, we create cells that each have 46 chromosomes. Now, because there is no replication of the DNA here in what we call the second meiotic division, I end up, sorry, I'm doing this with my mouse, with 23 chromosomes in, whoa, that's a three, can you tell? in each new cell. Kind of crazy, okay? All right, so meiosis one is the first division. This is where the homologous pairs are separated and correlated, and it's just like mitosis. It's just like the normal cell division, interface, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, cytokinesis, just like we studied. The second division is when those sister chromatids are separated. Because interphase is skipped, DNA is not replicated. So that's what cuts the chromosome number in half. So let's take a look at it. Now I know you can't really see this all that great, but if we start up here at the top, okay, I've got my chromosomes. The chromosomes are duplicated, so there's a, an exact replica of each one. In that first meiotic division, just like mitosis, the cells divide, okay, 
and they're separated into two new cells. Instead of going through interphase, they immediately begin to split again. So that centromere here is broken, that centromere here is broken, and each individual chromatid, which is now considered a chromosome in and of itself, moves into different cells. Now as you look at this, look at the end result. In your opinion, does each of those copies of DNA look similar? Look at this one compared to this one. Do they look the same? Does this one and this one look the same? Or would you consider all four of these products, those cells that are being made, to be genetically different? Hopefully you said yes. Now, in meiosis 1, we're going to look specifically at the phases. Remember, it still follows prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. So let's look at prophase. In that first division, this is a really, really, really special phase, and that's why we're going to write some stuff about, about this phase. In prophase 1, same process occurs. DNA coils up, forms those chromosomes, the nucleus disappears, and the spindle fibers form, attaching to those centromeres. Now, while those homologous pairs of chromosomes are pairing up, okay, during that reproduction um, and, and pairing up of those homologous pairs, sometimes the arms of the chromosomes right here overlap. While that DNA, all those supercoils are, are really quite fragile, and when they overlap, sometimes they trade places. Um, kind of like if you take pipe cleaners and fold them over each other, or, you know, kind of like those twist ties, how you take them and you wrap the ends and you wrap them around each other. Well, imagine if they were so fragile that they actually broke, okay? Now, here's the thing. These homologous pairs represent what we call um, a tetrad, and the tetrad represents a paternal, right here, and a maternal chromosome. When you were made, I know it sounds weird to think about, but when you were made, you had mom's chromosomes and dad's chromosomes come together and form. The sperm fertilized the egg and became a zygote, and that's what you are. Okay, so you have some of mom's genes and some of dad's genes. Think about it. You don't look exactly like either one of your parents. You're kind of a combination of both, and that's because you inherited some of their DNA from both of their chromosomes. Now, sometimes there's new combinations of genes, and that's because of this process here called crossing over. Crossing over occurs, and that causes parts of those chromatids to swap positions. When that happens, we have complete genetic reassortment. At the end of meiosis two, as those separate, poof, Boy, we got four different kinds of gametes. So metaphase one, now here's the deal. You don't necessarily have to write all of this down if you remember the phases. The pairs line up at random. One chromosome from each tetrad is attached to each centriole. In anaphase one, those homologous chromosomes are then pulled towards the centriole. So the mom chromosome and the dad chromosome, maternal and paternal, go to opposite poles. This is called independent assortment, okay? This term right here is one that I really, 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 really want you to remember, okay? I'm going to ask that you remember it because no matter who you have for second semester biology, they're going to talk about independent assortment of genes, okay? So if you can remember it now, it'll help you later. The random separation of maternal and paternal chromosomes, which leads to more genetic variation. You don't know which egg is going to get fertilized. It might have a mom chromosome. It might have a dad chromosome. Okay, so that's what's going on in anaphase, that separation of those, oops, of homologous pairs. Then there's telophase. The chromosomes reach the poles and cytokinesis begins. In meiosis two, remember, this is super important right here the cells completely skip interphase. So the DNA is not replicated. So there's still only 46 chromosomes. We go through the whole process again. The spindle fibers and the chromosomes start to move. They line up in the middle during metaphase. The chromatids break apart. 
the nuclear membrane then forms around the chromosomes. And in cytokinesis 2, we have four new haploid cells. Okay? Now, in the formation of gametes, okay, in animals, this meiosis process occurs in the reproductive organs. Okay? In the testes in the male and in the ovaries in the female. Right? So, let's look at the male process. In the male process, there's what's called spermatogenesis. And this is to create the four gametes called spermatozoa. Those four cells that are produced by meiosis are called spermatids. They are eventually in males what develop and mature into sperm cells and are all functional. All four of those that are created are functional. So we've got the first division and then we've got the second division. Now, tell me about the maturity. When exactly does that happen in males? Remember, that doesn't happen until puberty. They don't have fully functional sperm, sorry guys, until you hit puberty. Now, but, well, here's the thing. They make four. All right, oogenesis. This is the female process. It's meiosis, but we call it something different in each gender. So in oogenesis, this is what produces um, a single mature egg cell, or ova. There's only one produced in each meiotic division. So what happens during cytokinesis 1, okay, we've got, we're going through the process, here's the first division. There's actually more cytoplasm given to one cell compared to the other, okay? We call this a polar body now. It contains chromosomes, but it doesn't have enough cytoplasm or organelles to sustain itself, okay? As that division occurs, both of those two are going to be um, kind of dud cells, if you will. This secondary oocyte, the one that's produced that has all the cytoplasm, divides unevenly again, producing a third polar body and what's going to be the mature egg. Now, here's the thing. This is so different in females in that this occurs in a female before she's even born. She has mature eggs in her body from day one after birth. Okay? Now, how come females only make one gamete during meiosis and males make four? Well, if you think about it, when reproduction, the actual act of reproduction occurs, only one egg has been released during ovulation, right? Females only release one egg a month, but males ejaculate millions of sperm, okay? Because many of them die on that journey to the egg, okay? So it only takes one sperm to actually fertilize the egg, but if only one was released, it might not make it. So that's our way of ensuring reproductive success. Now, asexual reproduction versus sexual reproduction. What is the difference, okay? It's, we're going to look at a couple of different things. First, we're going to look at the number of parents involved, the gametes involved, and does it produce genetically identical offspring? So how many, par or how many parents are involved in asexual reproduction? Because exactly how do we define that? Asexual reproduction involves, ah, can you tell that's a one, a single parent. It's one cell reproducing to create another one. Are there gametes involved? No. That's a really bad, oh, sorry. Genetically identical offspring. Is there any genetic variation? Not a whole heck of a lot. So we're going to go ahead. My mouse is like not working very good, you guys. I don't know what's going on here. Let me try something else. So we're going to say yes to this one. Wow, this is really terrible writing today. Sorry, I don't have a mouse pad with me. Um, ha ha. <laughs> I look like I'm in kindergarten right now. All right. So sexual reproduction. How many parents are involved? Two. That's a really big two, by the way. Gametes involved? Absolutely. Wow. Yes. 
<laughs> it's not working at all. And then, are there genetically identical offspring? Right? Do you look just like your parents? No. All right? So that's the difference between um, sexual and asexual reproduction in organisms. So keep that in mind as we go into the next semester, um, as we, I shouldn't say next semester, into the next unit.